Welcome and thanks for coming. Today I will summarize key findings of my dissertation research and present to you the overarching purpose of the research I conducted, the theoretical framework I developed that extends existing theory and puts the research into context, the specific questions and hypotheses I developed that the research addresses, the methodology I used to conduct the research, the results of the research and interpretation of those results, and the importance of this work and its greater impact and directions for future investigation. The book publishing landscape has changed dramatically during this first decade of the 21st century. These changes are driven by advances in technology, the evolution of computer-mediated communication channels, and marketing forces that continue to concentrate mainstream publishing houses into mega conglomerates, while at the same time spawning thousands of niche market players and perhaps hundreds of thousands of self-publishers. Today, people look not only to the mass media for consumer information, but also social media, where recommendations come from friends and family or like-minded consumers. In the meantime, traditional sources of reviews and advertisements, such as newspapers and magazines, continue to decline. Technology has made it easy for authors to self-publish, and new business models, such as print-on-demand and computer-based authoring tools, have eliminated barriers of printing, warehousing, and sales outlets. Ebooks, many of which may never be printed, now account for 20% or more of sales from major publishers. There is a hyperabundance of choice and a heterogeneous marketplace, comprised not only of bricks and mortar stores, but online marketplaces with virtually unlimited choices. In 2011, at least 1.5 million new titles were published in the United States alone, a 400% increase in just five years and the number of self-published titles has eclipsed titles produced by mainstream publishers. The full count is in fact unknown and virtually unknowable, since large numbers of new titles never acquire an ISBN number. Only a portion of sales of books, and especially of ebooks, are tracked by companies such as Nielsen, and then only sales from major outlets are typically counted. Only a small number of titles are reviewed annually by the trade and popular press, perhaps 25 or 30,000 at most, and opportunities for previously common sources of book browse, such as displays in bricks and mortar stores, are becoming less common. How do readers find the books they want to read given the number to choose from and navigate the diffuse and disparate sources of information about them? Information about books is moving online and marketing for books is moving online as well. According to marketing surveys, friends and family are among the important sources for book recommendations, along with computer-mediated social channels, advertising, and various forms of search and automated recommendation systems. Many of these interactions occur today within online social networks. Traditional mass media marketing is out of the price range of all but the likely best sellers from major publishing conglomerates. Authors today, self-published and traditionally published alike, are proactively taking action in order to connect readers to their books, and even traditional publishers with media budgets expect authors to shoulder some of the responsibility for getting their books into the hands of readers. The research I'm going to describe to you today looks at how authors use social media and how social media can be used as a strategy to connect readers to books. In particular, the research looks generally at samples of current literary output and the kinds of social media outreach the authors of those works are using to connect potential readers, if any. This research provides a first look and estimation of the relative impact of those strategies on discovery and readership and lays a foundation of understanding for how these strategies might work. The name I've given to the framework I've developed is social gatekeeping, and I'll start by describing, at least briefly, its foundations and theories of communication, marketing, social network theory and dyadic communication, and library and information science. Social gatekeeping extends these theories to support my research. Point one. I'll first mention the traditional publishing chain as described by book industry expert John B. Thompson. This view of publishing draws from the management and marketing literature on commercial supply and value chains. 
The publishing chain consists of the succession of intermediaries who act to select, filter, and add value to a literary work as it moves from the author to the publisher to the market and finally to the reader. So we start with the author who creates the content and follow it along to the publisher where various intermediaries add value such as copy editing, design, typesetting, proofreading, printing and binding, and sales and marketing, warehousing, and distribution, and finally to booksellers who get the work into the hands of readers. Through the end of the 20th century, this supply chain is the principal way books made their way from author to publisher. There were few alternatives. There was so-called vanity self-publishing, but vanity publishing lacked access to the publishing chain, and very few books published that way found readership. As traditionally conceived and illustrated by Thompson, the publishing supply chain relies principally on mass media, including both marketing and reviews, to initiate information flow and promote discovery and sales. Point two. Gatekeeping was first proposed by Kurt Lewin in 1947 and is initially presented in vision channels through which food came to the table, such as from the garden or from the market. Gatekeepers are the decision makers at key points in the channels, called information gates, where critical decisions about what might pass through the gate are made. Lewin found that the key to influencing what made it to the table was to influence the gatekeeper. Gatekeeping has since been adopted by many disciplines as a theory, framework, or model. In the field of journalism, gatekeeping by editors is posited as the mechanism by which millions of messages are filtered, modified, and transformed into the few that make their way to readers. This is primarily an act of information filtered out. Library science also recognizes gatekeeping in the literature, but in a different context. Librarians and other information professionals intermediate information and curate it by finding the best work and making it available. In this sense, gatekeeping is a positive force for discovery and knowledge transfer, and this is primarily an act of information filtered in. So while rejected authors often think otherwise, gatekeeping is not necessarily bad. Gatekeeping serves to filter out poor quality while promoting the best work by the best authors, made better by the services of experts in the publishing chain, such as editors and artists. Point three. Once information reaches someone within a social network, say through mass media advertising, social network theories and communication theories describe how information diffuses through those networks. I'll mention the two-step flow of communication theories developed by Paul Lazarsfeld in 1944 and subsequently by Elihu Katz beginning in 1955. These theories were proposed as a counter to early theories about mass media that posited that mass media had direct and powerful effects on individuals. The two-step and multi-step flow theories suggested instead that mass media reached certain people who were then responsible for influencing others in their social circles. I'll also mention Everett Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations work, first presented in 1962 with several editions since then. Rogers writes that the first two phases of innovation, adoption, or knowledge, which is discovery, and persuasion, the influence to adopt. Rogers writes that, quote, diffusion and adoption gatekeeping is controlling the flow of messages through a communication channel. One of the most crucial decisions in the entire innovation development process is the decision to begin diffusing an in innovation to potential adopters, end quote. Point four. Mark Granovetter's 1977 article, The Strength of Weak Ties, offered an explanation of how information traverses social networks by positing that new information often comes to an individual from those in one's network who are socially distant. Granovetter noted that while close friends tend to be homophilic, that is, alike in things like education, taste, opinions, and views, close friends aren't a good source for new information because there's a good chance the information is known already. And while homophily and strong tie relationships are important factors in persuasion, it is the weak tie who hold information not known to the strong tie individuals. The weak tie effect on sharing behavior on Facebook and other networks has been experimentally demonstrated. And another factor is that individuals tend to have more weak ties than strong ties. Point five. Finally, from library science, we have theories and explanations for information-seeking behaviors, and two of them often compared are search and browse. Searching, that is, looking to find something specific, is more often than not focused, convergent, goal-oriented, and systematic. 
Browse, on the other hand, is less focused and used when specific information needs are not yet fully defined or understood. Browse, then, compared to search, is divergent, dynamic, and undirected. Successful browse depends on the seeker to recognize and make new associations that serve individual needs for information. In the library literature, a term often applied to browse is serendipity, an unsought, unintended, and or unexpected discovery and or learning experience that happens by accident and sagacity. Point six. If a person knows the author and title of a book or has a very focused idea of what the book needs to be about, then conventional search strategies are often successful. But other strategies may be employed. A person may ask a friend or family member for a recommendation, or may visit a social website where readers hang out to browse favorite lists or author pages, or may turn to blogs or other venues. These are all cases where an individual may find and connect with people not in their networks, even weekly. Computer-mediated communication channels make it relatively easy to find previously unknown individuals who may, through their posts and messages, trigger an information transfer to the browser, who in turn may create, forward, or otherwise move the information across social networks where no prior measurable tie exists. I've called this phenomenon the serendipitous tie, which is an incidental, chance, or accidental interpersonal relationship event that may occur between people not otherwise socially connected, by means of which information may be passed and communicated from one individual, and potentially one social network, to another individual and social network. This slide shows a Venn diagram view of the classical view of information diffusion between networks via a shared weak tie relationship. Here, weak ties serve to bridge information flow between social networks. This slide shows a view of the way information penetrates a social network, either through serendipitous ties in which information is exchanged between people who do not necessarily have weak tie affiliations, and also directly from mass media influence. Network researchers are aware that information comes to a network from external sources, but this is something they often control for in research. The classical view of weak tie influence was confirmed in a study by Bakshai and others uh, that looked at over 200 million uh, wall posts across Facebook's entire platform in order to study sharing patterns of strong and weak tie relationships, which, by the way, convincingly demonstrated Granovetter's weak tie hypothesis. In this study, as a method of control, they actually blocked some shared posts in order to determine a range of limits to the amount of information shared by individuals who did not get the information from strong or weak tie Facebook connections. But I think that's an important construct, and the serendipitous tie, as I've called it, is actually a pretty interesting phenomenon, in part because it appears that the serendipitous exchange of information emulates mass media effects as described by the two-step and diffusion of innovation theories I've mentioned. So to summarize, social gatekeeping can be initially defined as the process of finding, selecting, filtering, and shaping information about a product, service, or idea, and making it available or not as a message accessible in a social communication channel. The message is the unit of analysis identified by a URL or some other kind of identifier. Further, the more messages there are that are shared, the greater the web presence of an author or book. Once these messages are out there, not only can people find them, but applications and processes can find them, and these often form the basis of recommendation engines, which analyze, pool, and extract social data as a marketing technology. So social gatekeeping can also be mediated by machine processes, and machine processes connect, can, can connect people and their data serendipitously, even without their explicit knowledge. Now let's take a new look at the traditional publishing chain. The traditional publishing chain is the sequence of gatekeeping decisions through which a book and its metadata progresses from author to agent to publisher to distributor and finally retailer. At each step, a gatekeeper makes decisions about aspects of the book and adds value to it. In the traditional publishing model of the 20th century, uh, shown here on slide 10, the publisher stands as the primary gatekeeper, directing the flows of the book and information about the book, the book metadata, as it works its way to the retail channel. 
While the physical book is working its way through editing, design, printing, and distribution channels shown here in green, information or metadata about the book is made available through mass media advertising and marketing, through a mass media network of reviewers and critics, and that flow is shown in red. The reading public might find it directly. For example, a reader finds the review, or sees the ad, or finds the book in a library or on a promotional table inside a bookstore. Or the reader might find it indirectly from a person of influence, such as a friend or respected acquaintance, who has learned of the particulars from the mass media. Then, word of mouth spreads the information through social networks. Traditional publishers have always relied on social networks and the word of mouth diffusion to reach readers. For mainstream publishers of the 20th century, the diffusion of information began primarily through mass media, with a smattering of direct-to-consumer marketing and direct marketing to persons of influence such as book club leaders. However, in the 21st century, as shown here on slide 11, computer-mediated communication facilitates direct discovery of books through online venues that bypass mass media gatekeepers and provide new mechanisms for the flow of book metadata. This includes discovery at point of sale, such as online markets, and discovery through computer-mediated channels, such as websites, blogs, social network fan pages, and other online social information constructs. The expanded view of the publishing chain as it, is, as it exists at the beginning of the 21st century shows that authors, authors and publishers no longer are constrained by the traditional publishing and mass media gatekeepers. Mainstream traditional gatekeepers still exist, and many readers trust them to provide high-quality reading experiences by virtue of the gatekeeping process. But now, technology, computer-mediated communication channels, and social networks have made it possible for individuals to act as gatekeepers to their friends and acquaintances, as well as to the web browsing public. For the author or publisher, social gatekeeping may be a strategy that supplements, and in some cases supplants altogether, the role of mass media in making information about a book visible, and which triggers the diffusion of information about the book through social networks and generally through the web. Authors have many potential pathways to enhance discoverability for readers. The principal organizing research questions posed for this research are, how and to what extent do authors connect to readers through social media, and what is the extent to which such use increases discoverability and readership? This is an important and fundamental question that needs to be addressed as the first step in testing the social gatekeeping framework. While this alone is insufficient to establish social gatekeeping as a robust gatekeeping theory extension, a negative result would serve to cast doubt on the framework's viability. The research focuses on ebooks as an emerging form of literary production, now 20% or more of sales even among major conglomerate publishers, and which by their very nature can only be acquired and read through some form of computer-mediated communication medium. This makes them ideal candidates for a study on the use of computer-mediated communication by authors. And further, while many ebooks have print versions, many are digital only. Selecting ebooks as the object of research provides an opportunity to compare digital only versions with digital plus print versions to see if there are any differences in the impact of author web presence on discoverability and sales. Point two, a limitation of the study is that the results and in interpretation are only strictly generalizable to books released and sold by Amazon, which was the focus of this research. Amazon accounts for the majority of sales in the book market, and an estimated 60% or even more, according to some analysts. It's true that there are an unknown number of books released by and available for sale at outlets other than Amazon that might generate different results. Limiting the study to Amazon data is primarily a result of the difficulty in generating a true random sample selection of titles from other sources. Of several potential sources reviewed, only Amazon provided both a search browse function that could return a complete population of books in an unbiased return order, and robust computer-based access to the ebook's internal metadata. At this point in time, Amazon is the best operational choice to study the current universe of ebooks. The situation will undoubtedly change, perhaps sooner rather than later, as other players become stronger and as ebooks evolve. When that happens, the results from this Amazon study will provide a baseline from which to observe changes. Point three, 
So the research is based on a random sample of ebooks drawn from the total population of 8,000 or so ebooks released on Amazon between March 31st and April 5th, 2012, inclusive. The use of a true random sample drawn from a total population is a standard assumption of many statistical tests, including regression, which was the primary statistical tool used for the quantitative analysis that I'll discuss shortly. Point four. I also generated a list of the most popular ebooks from lists of the best selling paid and most downloaded free ebooks on April 6, 2012. The second sample was used to provide a look at successful ebooks and compare these exemplars with books from the random sample. There are some interesting differences between the two samples that you'll see when I present some of the results. Note, though, that the popular sample is not a random sample, nor is it intended or used as a control group. It was collected and tracked along with, but separately from, the random sample data set in order to provide exemplars that could be used to compare aspects of popular ebooks and authors with ebooks and authors in the random sample. Unlike the random sample, which consists of ebooks released during one short period of time, publication dates of the popular sample were not date limited, and so may have been in the market for months or years and undergone previous cycles of popularity. Further, author web presence may have changed over the course of the release, where the title was on the market for an extended period of time. These factors should be taken into account, therefore, when interpreting the results I'll present shortly. Point five, data about the eBooks were tracked and collected weekly for 15 weeks throughout the summer of 2012 using custom software and largely automated methods. While that was going on, information about publishers and the author's use of social media along with other descriptive data, was collected manually through search techniques. The diffusion of information about a book can be measured a few different ways. Search engines can be used to perform specific queries about books, and a count of the returns, that is, the search engine hit count, will reflect book web presence if the query has high recall and precision. Sales can be directly compared if known, or inferred from estimates derived from Amazon sales rank. Presence may also be reflected in counts of reader reviews. Although it may not be possible to count every instance of relative relevant web, page, web pages, sales, or reviews, sampling them consistently and without bias provides a means of comparing titles and estimating the extent to which certain factors might predict greater diffusion. Slides 14 and 15 show the main data elements collected for analysis. The dependent variables designed to measure book web presence include search engine queries on ASIN, which is the Amazon stock identification number assigned to each ebook, and also searches on a specific quoted author title phrase, Amazon sales rank, Amazon review ratings and counts, and offer price along with a few other miscellaneous data points. Independent variables are examined to determine whether they predict differences in the measured dependent variables. Six methods of social media outreach were collected as the independent variables for author web presence. An Amazon author page, which an author may claim and post biographical information and links to other social sites. A Goodreads author page, which similarly provides a mechanism for authors to connect to readers on that social network. A Facebook page, a Twitter account, a website, and a blog. These were selected for review based on an earlier review of selected ebooks as being representative of the social media use by authors. The research natu naturally fell into three phases, which are interrelated and that in total provide evidence consistent with social gatekeeping from multiple perspectives. Phase one included the collection, disaggregation, and classification of the data collected. Statistics generated from Phase 1 include totals and subtotals, plus some direct counts of sales that can be grouped by social media use, and other categories such as mainstream published or self-published. Because not all books in the random or popular sample were suitable for analysis of author social media outreach, for example, out of copyright classics, magazines released as ebooks, and some other categories, the classification effort was also used to identify the subset of approximately 325 ebooks used for analysis in Phase 2. 
Phase two of the research consisted of analysis of author web presence and social media participation as independent predictor variables and book web presence and sales as dependent variables. Multiple regression was the primary tool used to determine the degree to which independent variables could predict variance in the dependent variables. The social gatekeeping framework suggests that author web presence and participation in social media should associate positively with book web presence and sales. The multiple regression analysis was used to show which specific author web presence and social media activities might best predict sales and discoverability. The purpose of the phase three research was to conduct a review of selected group of titles from the random and popular samples in order to gain additional insight on how authors use social media, how authors may be leveraging the serendipitous tie, and what such a review might suggest for future research. In all, about 35 titles were chosen based on observations made on initial review during data collection, and also on results of the data collection, such as the book's ending data collection with the highest sales rank. The research questions for phase one are focused on sample description. I've also presented some of the data summarized in table format on the next slide. This slide shows some of the results I found particularly interesting. Republication of public domain books continues to represent a significant portion of title output, which reprises a 2008 study on which I was a team member on self-published books, as well as industry figures. Self-published book counts, 73% uh, of the total number of current authored titles, exceed even Bowker's estimates, possibly due to the number of self-published titles on Amazon without an ISBN. Most books, and especially self-published books, don't sell very well, or at all, at least initially. Large numbers of ebooks are published without print equivalents. There was an unexpected absence of enhanced ebooks and ebook applications. Because these are highly promoted on the Apple platform, this may be a platform issue, but we don't have a good idea even on Apple of the numbers of enhanced ebooks compared to the total number of ebooks. So this bears further investigation. In the random sample, but not the popular sample, I found short works, that is, 1 to 20 pages or so, most self-published. Some industry analysts, analysts think this is an emerging form of literary output. This confirms that, at least to a degree, and it bears further research. There are dramatic differences in no sales, books offered for sale that reported no Amazon sales uh, during the data collection window, uh, between authors who used social media and those who didn't. Authors who didn't use social media had almost double the number of no sales as a percentage of total as authors who used at least one form of social media outreach. Uh, see the chart, uh, sales as a function of social media use, uh, coming up on slide 19. Uh, this is strongly consistent with the predictions of social gatekeeping theory. So on this slide, I've presented some selected descriptive statistics. Um, you may want to pause playback if you'd like to study this in more detail. And here are the no sales and social media use uh, statistics that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. And again, if you want to study this uh, in more detail, you can pause the, uh, pause the recording. Now we move on to phase two. As a statistical tool, regression is closely related to correlation, and the background math is very similar. But where a correlation compares two variables to see correspondence between them, Regression generally posits one or more variables as independent and one variable as dependent in order to see whether and to what extent a change in the independent variable might predict change in the dependent variable. So regression tells us about the relationship between several independent or predictor variables and a dependent or criterion variable. For this research, the dependent variable is one of the measurements of book web presence or sales, such as the search engine hit count or sales as estimated from sales rank. The independent variables are the six categories of social media used by authors, and they're tested as a group or model against each of the dependent variables. The purpose was to see whether and to what extent author web presence and social media outreach might predict discoverability and sales. Multiple regression is one of the most commonly used statistical tools, but that means that it's also probably one of the most commonly misused statistical tools. 
Common pitfalls include assuming that because it tests the relationship of variables set up as independent and dependent, that it establishes causality. And that's simply not the case. Also, there are certain conditions, some listed on the slide, where the regression may give misleading results. For example, if the regression is tuned by testing various combinations of independent variables in order to achieve maximum effect size, one variable may be given undue weight by leaving out a correlated variable. That's called omitted variable bias, and there are some other subtle traps. And finally, regression is not an experimental method, which is considered the gold standard for hypothesis testing. This slide shows the key statistics you need to understand in order to follow regression, and I'll explain what they mean and put them into context on the next slide when you see the results of my research. R squared is also called the coefficient of determination. It represents effect size, or the percent of variance observed in the dependent variable predicted by the independent variables. Model significance is measured by the F statistic and P value, which together indicate the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as the one that was actually observed, assuming the null hypothesis is true. In this case, results were considered significant if these odds were no greater than 5%. Standardized beta, or standardized coefficient, is the influence calculated for each of the individual predictor variables on the dependent variable, assuming the remainder of the independent variables are held constant, expressed in terms of standard deviations. Each beta is also individually tested for significance, and only significant betas are usually reported. Regression indicators apply to the whole model, including all the predictor variables tested. Betas for individual predictors may change as the model changes. That is, if predictor variables are added to or deleted from the model. The research questions all involve determining the various relationships between social media outreach and aspects of discoverability and sales. Social gatekeeping predicts that there will be a positive association between social media outreach on the one hand and discoverability and sales on the other, and these are formally stated as hypotheses. Simply stated, the research tests whether authors who use social media outreach enjoy greater discoverability in sales, and further, whether some kinds of social outreach may be more effective than others. There's also a research question uh, and hypothesis related to reviews. In all, 14 regressions related to the main hypothesis were computed, and all were significant. The only model not reported for the random and popular sample uh, used Google search engine hits of the Amazon stock numbers found on blog sites, and the hit counts were just too low to provide reliable statistics. The 12 remaining shown here were all significant, uh, with a probability of less than 5% that these results could have occurred simply by chance. So here on slide 22 is the table for the random sample, and as you can see, the R-squared values are in the low to moderate range, accounting from 18 to nearly 40% um, uh, of the variance observed in each of the dependent variables. Simply stated, that means that the social outreach accounted for between 18 and 40% of the difference observed in discoverability, sales, and reviews. We might expect this since the model doesn't include other things authors and publishers can do to increase discovery and sales, such as mass media advertising. So I consider this a good result. As you can see, a Goodreads author page had the best predictability of all the predictors. The way you might read these, if you look at the Amazon reviews column over on the far right, is that for each one standard deviation in the increase in author participation, uh, author participation on Goodreads, you might expect a 0.38 standard deviation increase in the Amazon hit count. So that's how you need to look at these data. Amazon recently bought Goodreads, and this number might explain why. I think it's interesting that none of the other predictors were significant, including Twitter, a blog, or a web page. In contrast now, looking at the results for the popular sample, we see a shift. Goodreads is no longer much of a factor, but Facebook ticks every, independent, uh, every dependent variable, and web page uh, ticks four of them. Overall, the effect size, that is the R squared values, are lower, as are the betas overall compared to the random sample. 
One thing you don't want to do with a regression analysis is to throw a lot of independent variables at it. The more independent variables you include, the more cases you need to be comfortable with the numbers. When I designed the study, however, there were some other things I was curious about, so I ran selected independent variables against sales to see what the numbers look like. I was not surprised to see that having a print version available might be associated with increased sales, but I was surprised to find out that when you look at social media use not as a dichotomized yes or no variable, but actually look at the numbers of interactions, only number of tweets was significant, and number of Twitter followers or number of Facebook friends was not. You might think that more actions would predict greater hits and sales, but that wasn't the case here. Also not significant was whether an author had more uh, than one available book. Uh, these are definitely areas for further study. So what do these results mean? First of all, statistical tests confirmed a basic hypothesis predicting a positive association between author social media outreach and book discoverability and sales. There was also a positive association between reader social reviews and ebook sales. The effect is low to moderate, which I believe is to be expected. The emergence of Goodreads as the most impactful predictor in the random sample supports the social gatekeeping framework. Goodreads consists of approximately 17 million avid readers who connect and post about books with 23 million reader reviews. It has the highest concentration of individuals posting and sharing information about books of all the social media tested. So it's not surprising that of all the independent variables associated with social gatekeeping, Goodreads is the highest. Facebook is also about friend and family sharing, more so than blogs or websites. Different predictors emerge for the popular sample, along with a lower effect size, namely Facebook and web pages. So Facebook and the web may play a more important role in driving sales once a title has come to the attention of a reader. This would be consistent with social gatekeeping and the theories on multi-stage processes of diffusion and adoption. And finally, some caveats. Um, as I mentioned before, causality is not established here. Uh, the regression values probably indicate relative importance of, but not absolute values of predictability. The regressions test social media outreach by authors, but not social media generally. That is, although Twitter, for example, wasn't a significant predictor here, it doesn't mean that Twitter may not be an important discovery tool, just not when used by authors. The research questions for Phase 3 were concerned with taking a qualitative look at some selected authors and titles. For confirmation of the selective selection of variables, for additional insight into the results, and as inspiration for future research. In addition, I wanted to look for evidence of, or ways to get more explicitly at the serendipitous tie, since it's not really tested by either the Phase 1 or Phase 2 analyses. The titles were selected on the basis of notes I made during Phase 1 classification of anything I saw that I judged was either confirmatory or new and interesting. In all, about 35 titles from both samples were scrutinized, and the sites were revisited nearly a year after the initial data collection to observe changes. I would summarize the most important impressions as follows. There's considerable variation in how social media was used by authors, with some using it in rich and complex ways, and others using it sparsely. This raises questions of how to maximize social media effect and how to evaluate both qualitatively and quanti quantitatively uh, the impact of social media use on discovery and sales. The review generally confirms the selection of dependent variables as appropriate and reasonably complete. Only a few authors are experimenting with alternatives such as Pinterest, StumbleUpon, YouTube, and LinkedIn, although these numbers appear to be increasing. I was surprised to see that links to Library Thing were relatively infrequent, even though Library Thing is a popular book-centric social network. There was a rather dramatic apparent increase over time in social site sharing widgets, which can be used by authors to track sharing patterns by fans. This is the feature most indicative of the serendipitous tie, and it shows that authors understand the importance of encouraging sharing behavior by visitors to their sites. This suggests that future research on the serendipitous tie might be most fruitfully examined using link tracking techniques, since information shared without explicitly observable tie status leaves few traces otherwise. 
Authors from the popular sample are active participants in social media, much more so than authors from the random sample, which perhaps may be an effect as well as a cause. And finally, some mainstream uh, publishers expect authors to come to them with well-developed social strategies as a condition of publication. This suggests that publishing experts recognize the importance of social media as a catalyst for the diffusion of information about books through the reading public via social networks. Reading and the cultural production of literary works are at risk without an effective way of connecting readers to books. As the nature of the book itself changes as text migrates to digital form and authors increasingly seek non-traditional paths to reader discovery and reception, traditional gatekeepers and their mass media represent only a small number of channels through which readers come to discover books. This research informs key stakeholders in the business and art of book culture of the changing nature of the reader-author connection, the emerging role of the author in connecting books with readers, and the role of social networks in facilitating discovery and retrieval. It also progresses gatekeeping theory to accommodate new social network conceptualizations and lays a necessary foundation for ongoing research into the study of the emerging digital book market in coming years. This research did not use experimental methods such as randomized field trials. Rather, these results, preside, these results provide the initial empirical foundations of support for extending gatekeeping theory to include social gatekeeping as an important construct that should be further explored and validated using more costly and complex experimental methods. As such, it establishes a research agenda that can be progressed using increasingly sophisticated methods and tools. One of the objectives of this research was to capture a snapshot of titles that could be examined and compared with other snapshots taken over time. There is considerably more information that could be mined from the data collected for this research that is beyond the scope of this research, so there is more work to be done even on these samples and the data already collected. High on the list of research questions that might be proposed for future research include reviewing libraries as a source of discovery and information diffusion, that is, their potential role as an independent variable predicting web diffusion and sales, and also their role as a dependent variable measuring web diffusion. Libraries and the role libraries play in both bibliographic control of digital titles and the degree and manner to which they make digital titles available is an evolving issue that could be informed by empirical research. The current involvement of libraries with ebooks is very unsettled. As this study is concluding, Amazon purchased Goodreads and had previously acquired an interest in Shelfari and Library Thing, also book centered social networks. What the outcome of this will be is unknown at the time of this writing, but it's clear that there is keen interest and awareness by commercial interest in social networks in general. For the book trade in particular, the growing importance of social networks as a catalyst for reading, and the ongoing evolution of the book in both print and digital formats should prompt continued scholarly examination of the role of social networks and the social gatekeeping framework play in connecting readers to books. More generally, the social gatekeeping framework and the role of the serendipitous tie in propagation of information through networks should be explored in other contexts to determine how, to what extent, and in what ways they are generalizable to other disciplines and fields of study. Thank you very much for listening.